Morning, everyone. My name is Lee Jondro, Senior Leader at Abundant Grace. And uh, I wanted to take a few moments of your time this morning and just share some things that have been on my heart. As everybody's in the practice of social distancing, uh, I kind of changed it in my own life. I'll be uh, painfully honest. It doesn't mean that I'm uh, saying we shouldn't be apart. But one of the things I've noticed is when I think about being safely distanced, uh, I'm able to stay in uh, a social c connection, if you will. And so one of the things that's been on my mind this week is where people are going and what they're doing with various things. And so this morning I wanted to share a story. Um, many of you may already be familiar with it. It's the story of the Good Samaritan. And in that story, there's a lot of changes that come up in people's lives. So I just wanna, I wanna begin with that. Uh, first of all, Father, I just thank you for each and every person that listens this morning. I ask you, Lord, just to bring blessing into their life. Father, touch down in their hearts and uh, release your goodness in the midst of all things. And so the story begins, it begins in the book of Luke, chapter 29 to 37. And I think everybody really embraces this. You know, we want our children to act like this. We want our families and our church fellowships to engage on these levels. And so I think it's, it's, it's liked and appreciated by young and old. And so the story is told, and it's about a man going from Jerusalem to Jericho. And he's attacked by robbers who strip him and beat him up. And meanwhile, a priest and a Levite pass him without helping. But a Samaritan stops and cares for him, taking him to an inn where the Samaritan pays for his care. And I think one of the things we need to do is kind of grasp where this is all coming from. The importance, if you will, of the story. Uh, we need to understand the times. We need to understand the, the concerns of this first century uh, people. And this is where Jesus and his followers lived. And so I, I want to share a few things on that, just kind of give us some context, if you will, about what's going on. I, I know many times people try to come up with a modern interpretation, and I don't know, I'm, I'm not saying we can't do that or that's not relevant, but for today, I just want to stick with the text itself. And so one of the questions that be, get, be uh, needs to be asked is, who are the Samaritans? They weren't just really outcasts. They were despised enemies of the Jews. and and we would have expected in a Jesus story to see a Jew become the hero of the story, and yet that's not what we got. Uh, many of the followers probably were surprised to hear that it was a person from Samaria. And so only by understanding this do we see the powerful revelation that comes through in the story itself. Um, the fact of the matter is, because they were a hated enemy, uh, and this man crossed the line to help, it becomes even more powerful for each one of us. And I think in the day of what many are calling social distancing, and as I said earlier, I choose to call safely distancing, I think we need to be careful that we don't lose our social connection. If we can call social media social media, then I think we need to be careful about social distancing because the last place we want to have, have it happen at this juncture in our place and time is we don't want to lose connection through telephone, through email, Email, through message, through messenger, through any of these connections. I know lots of my friends have already made the choice to just stay off social media because there's so much disinformation. I'm not talking about the fake news. I'm talking about no one really has a revelation. Even this morning in our community here, uh, I, we had been told as a community earlier on this week by the mayor that the National Guard was going to show up and, and work to have a possible uh, uh, secondary hospital if we actually needed it, which our prayer, of course, is that we wouldn't need it. But we would be disappointed in our leadership in a community like this if they didn't do the things that were necessary to plan for the next step. And so, you know, the, the Bible tells us in, in, in the Old Testament, it says, without a vision, the people perish. So in my community, I'm thankful for my leaders who stepped up and, and brought us information. And so today, you know, the National Guard is going to be in our community. And uh, so what does this parable bring us to? It brings us to a vision of life, if you will. In Second Chronicles 2.28, Oded convinced the Samaritans to aid their Judean captives, and it insists that the enemies can pr be proven 
to be neighbors even in the midst, that compassion has no boundaries and that judging people on the basis of their religion or ethnicity is going to put us in a ditch. It's going to put us in a ditch personally as a community, as a nation. And so over, you know, there, there's a recent study in the last few years and I pulled some of the information. Over two thirds of our country and, and the people that were interviewed are concerned that people are less kind. And yet, ironically, and conversely, the same people, if given the opportunity to help someone, it absolutely reverses. So if we assume that 67 to 70% of the people are, consume, are concerned that we've lost our compassion, here we are, and the same studies reveal that 70% of the people wouldn't be helpful in those circumstances. And, and I think that some of that's come by distancing, and I'm not even talking about what is being called social distancing in this day and age. I'm talking just about the events of the internet and things like that, and the ability to be in communication. When I was a child many, many years ago, I'm 64, uh, you know, we had, we had two methods of communication. Well, actually three, I'll, 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 I'll admit to three. One is, I'm not talking about mail or anything like that, but we either went to see our neighbor, um, we picked up a telephone, or our parents yelled at us across the neighborhoods to get us. I'm always reminded of that, that commercial for spaghetti, you know, where Anthony's being called from the balconies of his, his mother's home because dinner's on the table. And uh, so what was found, you know, this, those results were, were commissioned. It was, it was a study commissioned by the Bible Society. And, and they were exploring, at the same time, they were exploring the parable. So let me read the thing in its entirety to you, just so you have full context. And if you're not a Bible person, that's okay. And if you're reading along, uh, I'm reading out of the NIV. Uh, but whatever you have, that's fine. <clears throat> On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. And he said, Teacher, what must I do to inherit life? What is written in the law? He was at, he replied, how do you read it? And the man answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus responded to him again, the, the, the proverbial question, what is written in the law? How do you read it? And he, and, 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 and you know, he, he answered correctly. Jesus continues on verse 28. He says, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But the man wanted to justify himself. And he continued on. He says, and who is my neighbor? You know, at that point, the teacher, and, and I'm pulling away from the, the, the scripture for a moment. The teacher intended to trap Jesus, but Jesus turned the whole conversation around. When eternal life comes down to loving God and loving your neighbor, the man wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus a question intended to quibble about who's my neighbor. And Jesus answers the question by telling a story about the man beaten, robbed, and left to die on the side of the road. Both a Jewish priest and a Levite, who's an assistant to the priest himself, pass him by. This would have shocked the man, the student of the law. This would have shocked him because of all the people likely to show compassion to a fallen Jewish traveler, it would have been one of these guys. Both go to the other side of the sidewalk, or the other side of the road. They, they cross over and they go out of their way to avoid him. Let's return to the scriptures. Uh, verse 30 says, In reply, Jesus said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. The priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed on the other side. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came to where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him, he bandaged his wounds, he poured on oil and wine, and then he put the man on his donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, and he gave them to the innkeeper. He says, look after him. And when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense that you have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robber? And the expert in the law replied, 
the one who had mercy on him. It's always going to come down to mercy. Jesus, I believe, intentionally chose the Samaritan to be the hero because he's the most unlikely candidate. As I mentioned earlier, they were mortal uh, enemies. And in fact, the Samaritans were so hated that when traveling from Judea to Galilee, Jews went to great length to avoid Samaria. And just a little side note, think about the Samaritan woman and Jesus meeting her at the well. That's one for you just to go look up. But, you know, it was out of context. It was out of character. And it was bordered on the line of forb for being forbidden. Jesus told him to go and do likewise. And so the parables challenge has a couple of things that we need to look at. Uh, Paul Woolley says, It is a spectacular invitation to a life of self-giving that insists we roll up our sleeves and help no matter what it takes. But it also challenges us to recognize that there are no limits to our neighborhood or our neighborliness. It demands that even those who are hated and feared are to be seen as our neighbors. The implications of this parable, both ancient and modern, are radical indeed. As part of this continuing research that the Bible Society was doing, uh, they conducted a social experiment. They took a Baptist pastor, they dressed him up, and he wore his dog collar. You know, that's what they call it. Um, he wore his collar and he went out onto the streets and he asked strangers to borrow their phone. And the results were immensely positive. He then dressed up as a homeless person and asked the same question. This time, however, he found that people were less willing to help. Martin Luther King had this to say. He said, on the parable of the Good Samaritan, I imagine that the first question the priest and the Levite asked, if I stop to help this man, what will happen to me? But by the very nature of his concern, the Good Samaritan reversed the question. He said, if I don't stop to help this man, what will happen to him? So I want to take you on, you know, just I want to share a few few things to follow up on this. My my heart is that we participate with one another to the best of our ability. Who's my neighbor? I, I, I think it's boundless. I, I don't think there's a rhyme or a reason that necessarily makes sense. I can think that my neighbor who lives next door to me is my exact neighbor. And I have great conversations with them. But what about the the homeless man that I meet on the, the path when I'm walking on a daily basis? What about the person who makes me uncomfortable? And, and you know, one of the things I've had to work through in my own life are my own fears and my own anxieties. I think, um, <clears throat> I think it's important for us to recognize that this is what Jesus is laying out. And we're empowered by grace, so theoretically, and spiritually, we ought to be able to do what Jesus asks of us because grace is the empowerment, grace being the person of Christ himself who dwells within us and about us. And so I want to share um, a few things, observations, if you will, about this and uh, let them be points for us to consider as individuals in our own communities. The first one is, that the Good Samaritan didn't walk away. He was actually doing something, or he was doing what the scriptures tell both you and I to do. He wasn't saying, I need to do this, and, and not following through with his actions. He was actually being what so many call the hands and feet of the Lord Jesus. And he followed Christ's example of love and compassion. So the question becomes, if I came across the same scene, or you came across the same scene, uh, of a man injured and near death, what would I do? Would I walk away? Would I, would I leave? Um, it's one thing to quote scripture and share platitudes, if you will, on loving God, but if we're not willing to get involved in people's lives, then I, I, you know, I, I just think that you know, that's, where, that's where my children, when they were young, would just go, what a hypocrite. And, and that word gets bandied about a lot but um, not only did he treat him and bandage him, but he put him on his own donkey and he took him down to an inn. And he said, um, you know, here it is. Now he could have said to himself, hey, I'm a Christian. In this case, he would have said, I'm a Samaritan and I give to my church and I donate to Salvation Army maybe. And I've done my part, but he didn't. 
He had compassion. And he acted upon those things. The second point that we run into is he didn't care that he was a despised race, if you will. Even though he was considered the lowliest of low, uh, it didn't stop him from helping the man. It would have been easy for him to say, you know what, he's got money, he's got cash, he's got this, he's got prestige, he doesn't need me, and who cares if he does? But that, that wasn't his response. I think we need to ask ourselves, am I willing or do I regularly follow this example? Uh, if, if we judge by outward appearances, are, are we considered worthy because we, we dig in? You know, one of the things that, that, you know, faith without works is dead. That's what the book of James says. And, you know, I, I look at it, he ignored the racism uh, that existed of the day. He rose above it. It would be, and, and again, I don't try to draw similarities, but it would be like, you know, a, a slave in the 1800s who went out of his way to help a white person. You know, perhaps even the plantation owner or slave owner himself. And so we need to begin to, to look at that. The, the, the third point was clearly he had stored his, his finances because he had, he had the finances and he could have always been looking for bigger and better. But in this case, he, he took care of someone who was worse off than himself. He had, you know, he had these finances, you know, uh, Margaret Thatcher once said, uh, you know, that this was a man who managed his money. He undoubtedly lived on a budget and spent less than he made and had a contingency fund for these kind of things. And I think that we need to look at that. That, you know, despite who he was, he carried himself well, if you will. You know, we've often in our own fellowship and perhaps in, in the places you've been, we've talked about stewardship. How do we take care of what we've been given, you know? People, people talk about giving and they talk about tithing and that's not something that I personally talk about. You know, but Paul says pretty clearly in the New Covenant, he says, you know, uh, give without manipulation, give freely and, and do it with, with a cheerful face. And too often we get caught up in uh, just giving to, not, to give or not giving because we don't trust. But when we recognize that all things are given unto the Lord and we can do all things cheerfully, then that changes how we, we give and what we do in our, you know, in our own lives. So he, you know, he had money, and and clearly, the next one is that he was honest when he showed empathy for this man. You know, he uh, he could have just hated him, and maybe this guy hated him after the fact. But you know, the question becomes: Are we trustworthy with what we've been given? You know, he probably had been to the inn before I doubt if the guy would have just let him drop this guy off and so maybe he had even paid for somebody else before this so the innkeeper trusted the Samaritan and because he had proven himself to be trustworthy so the question becomes for each and each one of us am I trustworthy with what what's with the opportunities before us before me you know am I doing all that I can do with what I have regardless of whether it's little or big and, and finally, you know, he was charitable. The man was near death when he found him. Not only did he help him out, but he took it upon himself to take care of him for an extended period of time. This was someone who uh, would be hated. You know, the Samaritan would be hated had he been seen. And yet he chose the path of Christ. And, and, and the question becomes, you know, would I do the same thing? And again, to use Margaret Thatcher in this, no one would remember the Good Samaritan if he only had good intentions. He had money too. And of course, you know, he was not a historical figure. He was a, he was a fictional man that, that Christ used to teach a lesson. And so for us in this day and age of social distancing, and you know, again, I choose to cheerfully call it safely distance, socially communicating. Uh, I don't like communicating this way. This is not my style. Uh, I'm much more comfortable walking around uh, when I'm talking. I, I love walking with people and hanging out with them and, and reaching out and finding out who they are. I think that uh, one of the things that's been of great concern to me, and I've mentioned it uh, multiple times to our fellowship and 
and through other teachings that I do in different places, is I'm concerned about isolation. So while I don't have a neighbor who's lying on the side of the road, I don't, I don't have somebody that I might even be hated by, lying on the side, bloodied and beaten, perhaps near death. And maybe, maybe, you know, I run across that situation, but it's more likely that I run across the situation of my neighbor. The other day, you know, I, I met someone I had not talked to. She was a teacher in the community and she was heartbroken that she wouldn't be able to see her kids except through this medium. And I met another person and she came up to me and kept her distance, but she said, I really appreciate um, the way you reach out to people. And I thought, wow, um, she's the next, you know, within a few doors of me forever. And, and I wave to her when I see her and say hi and greet her good morning or good afternoon. But am I going to be challenged when the person comes up that I don't necessarily want to embrace? Am I going to be challenged when I move outside my comfort zone of who I like hanging out with best? I think it's really important that we understand that who we hang out with is, is really, really important. But I long ago left the tribal thinking that I'm seeking my own tribe. What I'm seeking is the heart of the Father. And, and some of us didn't come in to this relationship with God in any special way. And others of us just had dire straits that we ran up against and we had no way around it. And we've met with God somehow, some way, in an unusual circumstance. Someone would say in the kingdom of God, there are no coincidences. So each day I've devoted myself to uh, three meetings a day online with our fellowship and prayed for them and, and things And this morning. And I'm going to put up another video about this later on today. Um, I think that we need to be able to ask for help. That if we're going through a difficult time, and, I, and, and please hear me, I get it. There's people that, you know, just always are reaching out for help. And, and you know what? That's okay. Because my God is limitless in his supply and his provision. And I understand the frustration by someone who always seems to have their hand out and doesn't reciprocate or doesn't pay it forward, if we use that terminology. I think some of the things that we're, we're seeing is a community stepping up. I'm really proud of the community of Keene in this hour. Do I know there's some negative things that have happened? <clears throat> of course I do. But I also know that I seek out the positive in all things, and I look for the gold in each person's life, and every person has a value. May not have it initially to me, but they have it to him who created them. And I think that um, if we need help, it's important that we ask. You know, how we communicate that, I, I don't always know. Uh, you know, I share the story all the time that one of the hardest things about being a church leader some 20 years ago was not knowing how to establish boundaries. And one young man, he just always seemed to need help, and I'm not making fun of him. I, I'm just simply saying, you know, he called me up at 2 o'clock to ask me if I could come over and help him fix his brakes. I, 2 o'clock at night. Never even thinking about the time. Um... And, and I probably didn't handle it well. Today, I would probably give him money for a mechanic if it was possible. Uh, but I think that each one of us will be challenged in the coming day. You know, and what we do with it will be really important. Not just about salvation or whether we go to heaven or any of that. But it will be important as to what goes on in our own community. And what will happen that will change lives. So the, the Good Samaritan, for all we know, he, you know, this, this person he took care of could have been a multimillionaire. I often share the story about a friend of mine who was black and he lived in a, a country that was anti-black. And, uh, you know, he was treated, you know, and one day he, uh, he came to visit me and, or he came to visit where I was and I was on staff and he came to visit me and he, we were getting ready to go swimming or something and he took his shirt off and he was all burned and I just looked at him and I asked him I said buddy what is that all about and he says when I was young he says I was captured 
uh, taken aside by some bullies and they burned me with cigarettes and, and, and things like that. And here's a man who's a church leader, uh, was at the time then and still is. And if you were to ask me the miraculous things that came about as he ministered in grace to the white people of his country, even in the community he lived in, even in the community where he had been bullied and burned, uh, I think that's kind of the story of the Samaritan, if you will. And so I, I just want to close this uh, with you in prayer. Uh, I, I, I leave this with you if you need prayer for anything or you need to contact us. I'm not trying to grow my church. I'm trying to help people. I want to be a good Samaritan in the midst of everything that's going on. Uh, we haven't had a lot of finances, but the ones we've had, we've put into our community. Uh, we don't have a lot of volunteers, but the ones that we do have are invested in our community. And I'm not talking about our church community. I'm talking about our community at large. So, Father, I, uh, I just lift up each and every person who watches this video or listens to this podcast. And I ask you, Jesus, just to uh, bring goodness into their life. Heal them. Make them whole. Lord, uh, help them to ask if they need help. Not to be, oh, God, I hate to say this, not to be too proud. But, but, Lord, even to be too frightened to ask for help. So, Father, I pray for each and every person here. And I thank you, Lord, that your goodness would permeate and manifest in their lives. And I ask that in Jesus' name. Folks, like I say, if you need me, uh, I'm not trying to grow my church. I'm trying to help people. And if you're a person who needs a hearing ear, um, reach out to me. Thanks, and God bless you.